Ik open de zitting van de commissie ter beoordeling van het proefschrift en de stellingen van Bas Nijholt, Master of Science in Applied Physics, Technical University Delft. De verdediging zal in het Engels worden gevoerd. I request the promovendus to go to the lectern, which he already did, so that's good. A warm yeah. yeah, it's a very sorry. Think. It should work now. Yeah. 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 So, a warm welcome for all uh, who are present in this public event by the candidate of the dissertation entitled Towards Realistic Numerical Simulation of Majorana Devices. The board for doctors of the TDL has installed a committee to evaluate the dissertation and propositions. The committee will have a debate with the candidate in public. It's an honor to present the members for this committee, to whom I extend a hearty, hearty welcome. First of all, Professor Prada from the Autonome University of Madrid in Spain, Professor Higginbottom of IST Austria, Professor von Oppen from the Free University Berlin in Germany, Professor Beinacher from the University of Leiden, Professor von der Seiten from Delft University of Technology, the co-promoter Dr. Wimmer from of the, this university and Dr. Ackman of, of Delft University the promoter. I, will, I would now like to start the opposition and I give the word uh, to Professor Prada. Thank you very much. <coughs> I, I would like to congratulate you uh, for this beautiful and very interesting session, uh, especially for the community of Magellan and Anawayas and devices. I think, I think you've done uh, a good job uh, with the number and quality of your draft publications, uh, with the thesis writing. I have appreciated that it is concise and to the point. And I also feel that you have the opportunity to learn about the very hot and active, uh, active field of research in condensed matter physics nowadays, both from a theoretical and conceptual perspective, as well as for the valuable numerical tools and methods that you develop, which I think that in one way you well equipped uh, to continue the research career if that is what you want. So I will start with my questions now, um, which are mainly devoted to chapter two. So let's go to this chapter and in particular to figure two from four. And I would like to uh, ask you uh, if the following is correct. I see that the uh, orbital effect sends along the shape of the uh, topological phase in the phase diagram and also the minimal value. But it looks to me that more or less the area of the topological phase uh, remains unchanged or even gets increased, as we can also see in figure 2.6. Uh, my question is, is this correct and why is this happening? Pardon, uh, is this question clear to you? Um, my Herr Director, yes, I think this question is clear to me. Okay, then please defend yourself. Hochleerde ah. opponent. Uh, thank you for your question and your kind words uh, about my thesis. So you're mainly asking about um, this figure in which uh, we see the phase boundaries for uh, or a Majorana phase diagram, uh, where on the x-axis we have or with magnetic field versus chemical potential, and then we see where the, the Majoranas would appear, which is in the colored area. And uh, your question is about like why the area of the of the phase diagram, or at least the colored 
the colored region uh, of versus top versus bottom uh, doesn't change much. Um, I think this is due to uh, the or the position of, at which the, the gap will close due to the orbital effect in, in the band structure. That's, uh, that doesn't change much, or at least it, it always happens at k equals zero. But, um, but yeah, the, the parameters don't depend much. But the, the important part is here, not that, that the area is similar, but uh, the quality of the Majoranas, namely in the ones at the bottom, you see the gap is very low everywhere except uh, within the topological region. Uh, so even though the, the, the area remains constant, it's very unpractical to, uh, to try to create Majoranas in higher, uh, yeah, more Majoranas at once in the higher bands. Thank you for your question. Um, what I think is like uh, this. Actually, I've been something I've been thinking about in the recent days as well. Uh, and from the literature uh, that I read, it's that uh, even though the spin orbit or, or the so so the spin orbit is an effect of the electric field, and uh, this electric field uh, is not always perpendicular to uh, to the wire but might also so bend, for example, because of the results of uh, an external gate and the interaction with the superconductor that is not placed perfectly on top. Um, my understanding of it is that you would have to, uh, like having the position dependent uh, spin orbit coupling would be, and having it uh, aligned with the electric field everywhere within the wire would be identical to taking the average or uh, averaging over, over the density in the wave function and just putting in a constant uh, spin orbit coupling. Okay, yes, I agree. And uh, the last question in this chapter would be, uh, how does the, the shape of the electron wave function influence uh, your results about the orbital effects in particular? There has to be a, a great difference, I think, Okay, I uh, thank you for your question. I, I think uh, I understand what you mean. Is in uh, let me get the right page. So, for example, if we look at at wires like this, what you're saying is like the that the average density of such a wire would move towards uh, one side, the top or the bottom of the wire. Is that correct? Yes, and also depending on the back gate, what is, what is the sign of the back gate? For example, is going to to push the the wave function or Exactly. Um, so, so I think you're asking two questions, like how uh, would this density depend on the back gate uh, and how would this area matter? So to answer your first question, uh, 
why the, 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 like the direction that the wave function or the, the average density will move depends of course on the sign of the potential like what we put in but if we look at a uh, at for example this Hamiltonian uh, where we have let's try like this this chemical potential if the if the uh, if the electrostatic potential will enter with the opposite sign that would mean that uh, like if if the or if the chemical potential gets higher, uh, means the density would get higher. So if the uh, if the electrostatic potential gets higher, it means the, they're pushed out. So if the the backgate becomes more negative, that means more it will there will be more and more density within the wire. And because usually the backgate is at the bottom of the wire, this means that the the density of the wave function will be pushed up towards uh, the superconductor. Uh, this will have several effects, not only on uh, the orbital effect of magnetic field. Uh, for example, because there will be now the the wave, or sorry, the uh, the normal superconducting interface, for example, will become less or more transparent. Uh, the, the several parameters will be renormalized, and I think because then the average area of the uh, that the magnetic field penetrates. Uh, in this uh, density will decrease, and therefore mm -hmm. the uh, strength of the uh, orbital effect might decrease as well. Okay, very well. So basically, for these uh, effects to really play a role, uh, you need that this flux is of the order of uh, plus twenty or more. Is this correct? Yes, because yeah, mm -hmm. like at the or when whenever the magnetic flux. Uh, is of the order of one flux quantum, we expect that the, the band structure will shift uh, by order of the level spacing of the system. Okay, very well. Then I have a question about factor four. Uh, if you were for three. Yes. Um, I wanted to, to ask, uh, to the left we see the experimental results and to the right we see the your uh, later simulation. And in this case, I, I see the experimental results that the um, measure difference and conductance send this little mass from when you look at a positive or a negative uh, super gate voltage. Whereas in your simulations, uh, this delta VG going from negative to positive doesn't produce much changes. Why do you think there is such a difference between the experimental results and the simulation? Uh, thank you for your question. I think I understand what you're asking. Like where in the experiment, as we see, the the gate voltage changes from like minus three all the way to plus three volts, whilst okay. in this in the simulations. We only go from minus four milli electron volt to plus two milli electron volt. Um, so now I think it's important here to to realize uh, one thing, is that the um, the the value of the the chemical potential that we put in the uh, simulation will not exactly correspond to the values that are uh, are used or are resulting from the experiment. And this is because we. Honestly, we don't know uh, what the correspondence is between an external gate and a chemical potential that we just apply as a local term in the Hamiltonian. Uh, to answer this question, you would need to do uh, detailed electrostatics uh, calculations. Uh, and what we're trying to show here is that um, that even though we do we make the change, even though it's small, uh, there there is a difference. Okay, so uh, that uh, I understand that uh, yeah, it's difficult to, to know these uh, specific uh, values uh, I will do, but then what is the physical mechanism that is going on uh, in the experimental results uh, that is somehow not the same in your simulation? So there must be something that makes, uh, that um, produces this difference. Do, do you have any idea? Yeah, I think I. Uh, this is for a device where the superconductor uh, sits symmetrically on the top of the nanowire. Um, mm -hmm. 
And this means that like, uh, we don't ex expect that the electric fields will bend when, the, uh, when increasing the, the gate voltage. So the, I'm sorry, I, I uh, forgot the exact question. Yeah, the second question will be in the uh, experiment. Uh, in the upper panel, uh, we see that basically um, this gas doesn't change very much, whereas in the lower panel it changes a lot. Right, okay. That we don't know that, and then we will see lessons. I see, for example, that uh, the upper panel is more similar in the case in which they do not have orbital effect because the same is not orbital, whereas when we apply the orbital effect, it tends to give these high states. So the worry is because the orbital effects are not important in the first uh, experiment as compared to the other, or? Yeah, or it's okay. It's a question of where is exactly the real answer. I think uh, yeah. the of where is the real answer. I, I think I, I understand now what you mean. Like, I, I think maybe one thing I, th th you probably, uh, think that as well, but it's important that there is no correspondence between the left column and the right column per se. Um, but going from the, the column on the right, this one, uh, increasing the gate voltage means that we push the wave function more to the bottom of the wire and therefore the density, or yeah, the density will be much lower, or sorry, it will be lower in, inside of the wire uh, and therefore the superconducting gap uh, yeah, the, the average density feels less of the superconducting gap. Uh, and therefore, the gap closes faster as we start to rotate the magnetic fields. Thank you for your question and uh, nice words about my thesis. Um, I'm not 100% sure if I understand the question. Are, like, can, can you see uh, my thesis on the screen? Yes. So do you mean what happens in this area? I, I mean, a straight, there's a straight line from dark gray to lighter gray that extends from 35 down around the line There's a, it's a vertical line. Yes. Would, would this be similar to these transitions, these lines? Uh, no, it's ah. vertical. <laughs> and it would be easier to find. It's, you can see why it's very well. It's Very. This, this vertical line that stops here. See, there's a lot changing the 
Right. Okay. I I see. Uh, I understand which part of the phase diagram you mean. Um, My question to be clear is what changes at that point? It's not a question about the topological phase per se, but there's some change in the system. Uh, and that, that, is, that is what I'm curious about. Right. So yeah, we, we can say that it's not due to uh, any topological effects because it occurs both in the topological region as in the non-topological region. So what happens here, I, I must say I'm not entirely sure, but I can speculate. Um, so at this point, the, like there, you would create three Majorana or three pairs of Majoranas. Um, and at that moment, suddenly the gap closure, or from that moment on, the, the, the minimal gap is probably always at a, a similar momentum, whereas at the other parts is probably somewhere else in the spectrum. Hmm. But I don't have any other uh, physical insights at this moment into why this is happening. Okay. Fair enough. I will move on to my next question is similar. It's also about Japanese regimes. You, you mentioned in the section 2.4, you discussed calculating the topological phase diagram. And there's two things. One should that you explain. You look at the document at k equals zero. And then you additionally need to check if your system is actually gap. Okay. Yes. So my my question is in this in this case where the Fafian has changed signs, so now I'm going to the topological phase, and yet there's no gap because of some some orbital effect. What does the density of states, you know, say the tunneling density of states of such a system look like? Does it really look like just a metal? Does it look like a mix between a metal and an interesting superconductor? What does one see in such a case? I think, or thank you for your question. I think at this point, so the band structure has closed. Uh, like maybe I can illustrate this by looking at one of the band structures. So at this point, uh, like uh, depending on in which case we are, maybe we are at this plot. This means that, uh, yeah, that the, the band gap has closed. So there is. Uh, there is conductance, but the band gap. Sorry. So okay, what what happened in in those regions where a uh, where the Puffian change is sign, but there is no gap? It means that at that point the uh, the band gap has closed at zero momentum. However, at another momentum, the band gap is also closed, and this is completely allowed to happen uh, because as we uh, like kind of do, we do the symmetry analysis in the paper. And in general, uh, this Hamiltonian that we consider only has one true symmetry, which is the particle hole symmetry, which, which maps particles at positive energy and positive momentum to energies, negative energies at negative momentum. So there is, without any additional symmetry, this band cap is always allowed to close. So even though uh, the Puffin change is sign, so the topological invariant changes, there is no gap. So that also means that, that, uh, that this invariant is actually not really defined because there will not be any Majoranas because the spectrum is not gapless. And at this point, uh, it, it's, it's just a, like a, a metal that is conducting, yeah. I would say. Okay, that, that answers my question. So strictly speaking, is it strictly a topological superconductor in such a regime, or is it, is it a metal? What is this? Um, in this regime, it is it, it's it's a trivial. I would say it, you, I would call it a trivial topological superconductor. Okay, interesting. Okay, that is very interesting. And just um, okay. And I, look, okay, that answers my question about that part. Um, I'm also curious about the symmetries. You already mentioned 
Exactly. Could you speculate, okay, in a real experiment, somehow invariably these such symmetries are broken. Maybe I, I have a, I'm, I'm doing tunneling spectroscopy along the wire axis, or I have disorder. Do these things meaningfully break this symmetry? In a real experiment, should I, should I be worried about this thing taking effect or not if I put my table on the wire? I guess that's what I'm asking. So, uh, in principle, any uh, disorder, for example, would always break the symmetry. However, the question is like, how strongly will it will break it? And I yes. could argue, like, due to like averaging of of the disorder, maybe on average we would still have such a symmetry. So, uh, I think um, in the model that we consider, at least, which is of course not the experiment, there uh, there might be other terms that break, break the symmetry. Um, for example, there is uh, another spin orbit, uh, or mm, yeah, forgot the exact name of the other type of spin orbit coupling, uh, which is weak in this case, so we don't have to worry about it. So what I think is that uh, in the experiment, as long as you try to perfectly align the field, uh, you should not be in a problem. But what we also observe is that as you have a very small misalignment, for example, in the y direction, which is uh, the direction in which the effective uh, spin orbit field points, then you would have a problem. I see. And then you're back into this gamma's phase and gamma's regime. Exactly. The trivial topological CD. Yes. Very good. Um, okay, I think I'm sure I'm that I have one small question. It's, it's jumping way over to. I think chapter four, the yes, spinorbit protection chapter, and it's it's about the Ginzburg lambda. And I know this was not your focus, but I, it's such an important thing in experiments. I'm just curious. There, there's some some comments about how it was done. Is this is this like a console thing that people can do, or is this a highly specialized calculation? How, how does one go about getting this information? Exactly yes. So um, I think I understand your question. What I would like to highlight is that uh, I did not perform these simulations, uh, but I did collaborate with the person that did. Uh, and from uh, what he told me, is that these uh, these simulations of uh, trying to include the Meissner effect and or and doing the entire uh, uh, yeah doing the entire uh, Gins Ginsburg Landau simulation. Uh, requires very high computational, or has a very high computational demand. Um, so, to be honest, I don't think it's a simple console simulation. Uh, at least the way it was implemented, it's uh, it's probably somewhat non-trivial to uh, do this in general for any device. But I th I think it's certainly possible. I I remember somewhat that he uh, took some assumptions, for example, that. Uh, that the superconductor is always symmetrically around the wire uh, and such things. Okay, Professor, you're welcome. Are you satisfied with the I, answers? I am satisfied. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your opposition. I would like to move to Professor from Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, now, the uh, uh, let me also start by uh, first uh, congratulating you on a very nice uh, thesis. Um, as needless to say, uh, I uh, consider the topic of your thesis uh, extremely interesting, and uh, um, I certainly very much enjoyed uh, reading it. Um, uh, realistic uh, simulations of these nanometer devices are certainly very important, and I think especially the um, uh, collaborate, the close collaboration with the uh, experiment uh, emphasizes that there's a lot of physics to be learned uh, from these uh, um, realistic uh, simulations. Um, 
I also enjoyed many of the, uh, the results in your papers, but I'm not going to go through it for uh, lack of time. So let me uh, simply uh, let me start with my first question. Um, that will be uh, with regard to chapter three uh, on supercurrent interference. And uh, maybe let's simply uh, have a brief look at figure 3.1. Um, there you have uh, these nodes, and uh, first at zero field there's a large node, and then at larger uh, magnetic fields there are kind of the entrance nodes, uh, if you like. And uh, so you seem to be nicely able to simulate that and to understand that in terms of uh, the supercurrent interference. Uh, one thing I was missing was an estimate for that tells me how large these nodes entire magnetic fields are expected to be, you write there about an order of magnetic smaller than the low at zero magnetic field. But uh, so what can one, how, how does one estimate that? And what does one learn from the uh, magnitude of the critical current in these outer lobes? Hoogeleerde opponent, uh, thank you for the kind words about my thesis. Uh, I'm also happy with uh, that I was able to work with some experimentalists and apply my theoretical results there. Um, Concerning your question, so I think you are asking like whether, like how can we theoretically predict like how large these lobes are going to be? Right. That's correct. Okay. So in our paper, we are trying to we're uh, trying to explain why this fluctuation happens of of this supercurrent, and it turns out this is not a very simple uh, explanation. Namely, it involves uh, comparing many different types of effects. Uh, that enter the Hamiltonian or not enter the Hamiltonian. And what we found is that like uh, these oscillations, they happen because in, in the, the multimode wire that we have, there are uh, several, there are several uh, modes um, that interfere and this interference uh, or the interference due to the orbital effect of magnetic fields here spoils the superconductor or supercurrent. And now you asked, like, um, we mentioned, we gave a few uh, order of magnitude estimates. We say that the critical current becomes an order of magnitude lower. Uh, that's true. Um, one thing that is, uh, we cannot, or at least in, at this point in time, we couldn't answer uh, this exact question, namely, due to a lot of unknown parameters. For example, if we look at, uh, at, at this plot, which is in the same paper, which... Uh, which plots the critical current or the switching current. So uh, yeah, the way yeah the way that the critical current decays, uh, f and here it's a function of gate voltage, and here it's a function of uh, chemical potential. Like uh, the same here, I could give a similar answer to what I told Elsa, our professor Elsa Prada, uh, is where like we are, we are in theory or we are not aware of like how the gate. Uh, that is applied in the experiment exactly matches with the chemical potential. And that what you can see in this plot is like as we make very small variations in chemical potential, like we go from 10 to 20 uh, milli electron volt, which is uh, of like smaller than uh, or maybe on the order of the level spacing. So not a lot, you would not, at least naively, would a lot uh, or would expect that a lot would change. However, we observe strong fluctuations of the supercurrent. And therefore, I don't think we can make a very accurate prediction about like what the supercurrent would actually do, uh, and attach some certain numbers to it. So, but what we do see, we can reproduce this uh, quick decay, uh, where uh, I think we summarize all of our results in this figure, where we have figure uh, three point four, where we look at or where we include different types of effects and then the relevant plot is the one on the right and the relevant curve is the one in red. And what we see is that the only way we can reproduce the results that were obtained in the experiment where if we include both or all of uh, the orbital effect, the spin orbit effect and uh, or Zeeman and disorder. And now this is another parameter that we are not really sure of, of what the disorder value or the mean free path in this physical system actually is. So what we do see is that we can uh, quantitatively reproduce this, this behavior of a decaying supercurrent. However, uh, I would be hesitant to, to, to tell you exact numbers. 
So maybe I had one that, uh, question about the funding and a different question. I mean, could you, yeah. I was expecting that, for example, the will be contentiously on how the number of tiles in uh, your wire and uh, that you could at least say how it scales uh, with the number of uh, channels. Um, and maybe one could even back out the number of tiles from such uh, simulations. So I, mean, I guess you could probably, you, you can probably use this as a number. Yeah. Uh, a certain number of channels. Yeah, um, I think what we found is that the uh, that the supercurrent scales linear with the amount of uh, conducting channels that we have in the wire. Okay. Um, that's the one question. Uh, so you don't have so much time. Um, so another thing you write about in that chapter is that uh, uh, actually these functions will frequently be find out functions if you break uh, sufficiently many. Uh, um, but you say that the setup uh, obviously is not uh, set for uh, um, uh, measuring this find out uh, uh, junction behavior. So the question is, what would one uh, have to do in order to um, uh, confirm that these are find out functions and what, what, what would one learn out of such experiments if uh, yes. one would do that? Thank you for your question. I think I understand uh, what you're asking. Um, so. As you correctly said, like uh, it, this is a very chaotic plot, uh, like it contains many things, but essentially what it is, it compares uh, the critical current uh, and the current phase, phase relation that, uh, of certain points, including different types of effects. Now, this isn't theoretical calculation, so only here we can extract the current phase relation, which is this one. In the experiment, we can only measure what the switching current will be. So at which point, uh, at what kind of current bias would you have to apply for the, uh, for the solution to become from, the, from, go from the superconducting solution to the resistive solution. So, uh, and that means that like uh, in the experiment, the superconducting phase will automatically adjust uh, in order to incorporate this max or this, this uh, critical current. So, in the experiment that, that uh, my collaborators have done, there is no control at all over the superconducting phase difference. Uh, and in order to answer a question like, uh, how could we distinguish whether something is a phi junction or a pi or a zero junction, one would need to create a, a different types of type of geometry where you could apply a phase over the superconductors. Uh, this could, for example, happen in a squid geometry. Um, I cannot think of a good reason why it would be. From the like the conclusions from our paper is like the the supercurrent is not a good or is not a good device to indicate whether Majoranas might be there because there might like even the supercurrent as is in the appendix will create uh, some type of zero bias peak simply because of the supercurrent even though the Majoranas are not there and because the supercurrent evolves in such a complex fashion as in the in the plot that I highlighted earlier, uh, like here. It's very hard, I think, to to actually learn something from, uh, yeah, from the fact that we could know whether something is a phi junction or a zero junction or a pi junction. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe then, uh, I uh, I jump to the introduction. Uh, yeah. I think you're muted. You are muted. Sorry, colleagues. You have worked on a single experience experiment, which is probably the one which is beaten to death in a more extreme way of the 21st century. I don't imagine any other experiment 
which has generated hundreds, actually thousands of analysis. But you've carried it much further than many other uh, investigations, and I think there's something to be proud of. And I have just a few questions, uh, which I'm sure you'll be able to answer. Uh, the first one is in connection with the section 3.9.2. Our hoogeleerde opponent, uh, thank you for the, the compliments that you gave me on the, the work of my thesis. Um, so you're asking about the Shapiro steps measurement that we, uh, or that my collaborators have done, and whether, like, it, could you correct me if this is correct or not? Um, you're asking whether the missing Shapiro steps are actually uh, a signature of Majorana's or not? Is that correct? Suppose you would have observed missing odd-order Shapiro steps. Would you have concluded for minor affirmations? Here I have to admit that I am uh, not a expert at all in the theory of uh, Shapiro steps. So uh, I think I'm, I, I'm not in the state to answer your question uh, okay. in a correct way. Answer, that is, that is answer. One cannot be an expert on anything, right? On everything. So let me then, then move on to another chapter which perhaps will be a bit more lengthy discussion. That's chapter five, the robustness of minor advanced states and short junction limits. Now, I was suddenly, you start out by saying that it starts very general theory of normal superconductor hybrid systems distinguishes two limiting cases, long and short junctions. Now, I always understood this in the context of not NS junctions, but SNS junctions, typically point contact junctions, where you either have a very narrow point contact connecting to superconductors, or you have a long, let's say, wire connecting to superconductors. But I've never seen NS junctions discussed as long versus short. And in fact, if I just look at figure 5.1, Oh my goodness, this thing looks incredibly long, right? It goes on forever. There's this wire which extends, it's a very long wire. And I don't even know what you mean by junction. I mean, the junction probably is, is the, 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 the interface between N and S, which is very long and extends forever. And, and so first of all, perhaps you could explain to me why you would call figure 5.1 a short junction. It's long to me. Yes. Okay, uh, I, I think I'll definitely be able to answer this question. Uh, thank you. So, looking purely at figure 5.1, we could not determine whether this would be a long junction or a short junction indeed. Indeed, it looks very long, but we don't really uh, compare like actual length skills here now. Like uh, An easier way to see it would be to, uh, or uh, one often, or people frequently call the short junction limit, the strongly coupled limit, and uh, the, the long junction limit, the weakly coupling li limit, which I think might be uh, speaking more to the imagination, which is because we call something a short junction whenever the time that a quasi-particle will spend in the, su uh, in the superconductor is much longer than the time that it spends in the normal region of the, uh, of the system, the, the end part. And we can ask them, or we, we can do this by looking at several energy scales. Namely, the time that is spent in the superconductor is h bar over the superconducting gap, and the, the time that is spent in the, uh, the normal part is, is the Thaulus energy. And here, the Thaulus energy is actually something in which a length scale does enter. Namely, 
Uh, we write it down. Where do we write it down? I don't think it just interrupt me. You can just go back to the speaker and just know I like this figure. Right. You know, if I, if I, if I look at 5B and I was asked by a student in my class, please tell me these electrons, do they spend more time in N or in S? I mean, a student would look at the speaker and would say, well, I see lines, I see yellow, that's N, I see green, that's S. They hardly do anything in S. But just looking at this figure, it seems to me a no-brainer that this particle spends more time in N than in S. Did you say yeah. it's the other way around? I'm saying it's the other way around because uh, what effectively happens here is uh, this process is called, as, as you obviously uh, are very well know, this is a uh, Andreev bound state where an, a quasi particle that, that uh, reflects with the superconductor can do two things. It can either reflect normally as an electron, so just like uh, Snell's law scattering or it could actually enter the superconductor, which we, which we don't highlight in this figure, and it can then enter the superconductor, propagate over a certain length scale, and uh, Andreev scatter back as a whole. So uh, that, that we don't see, but uh, whenever such a process happens, when a quasi-particle, uh, uh, or for example, when an electron uh, is in such a path, it's reflected back as a whole, and at the moment that this happens, uh, this this other particle traces back the exact path that the electron took. Uh, so it has opposite momentum and uh, also has opposite energy, actually. And then it comes back here at the exact same point uh, as the opposite particle. And then it goes back. And then uh, it's the other part of the system. And then it might it will reflect back. And then if this is a bound state, this process will repeat uh, indefinitely. So it will again go on. Uh, over or through this process, it will scatter into an electron hole and back and forth. Okay, I, I, I think I understand what you mean. So let me then just ask one more question, and that will probably be the end of the whole story. Uh, is, is the system the actor? The, the, the normal part, is it that? What do you think? The... Strong, you say it's strongly coupled. So if it's strongly coupled, I would imagine it should, the proximity effect should reduce the gap. But I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't think actually it's gap. I actually think otherwise. Is the system gap? No, what? Um, you saying that you don't expect it makes me doubt, but I actually think that uh, the normal part of the system is is gapped, and namely it has this. It's because of the induced superconductivity or the proximity effect. But, but it might. Part, oh. okay, but what about particles? I mean, you, you very suggestively so but what about trajectories which are almost tangential to the interface? They will just propagate forever through this wire. They hardly see the superconductor. That is correct. Yeah. So it depends on uh, on the modes. However, in the in the short junction limit, all of the uh, all of the modes uh, that are within the gap, uh, they have the energy delta at zero phase. Okay. I, I'm Okay, probably we're not going to resolve this. I, I would think that you know, a particle which just moves tangentially to this interface will just never on ray reflect, will just go on forever and will not have a gap, and I wouldn't have a gap. But you say that's wrong, you say it's energy will be delta. I, I don't know, I just have a very different understanding of this, but, but I, 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 I wanted to leave you the last word, and then I will just give this back to it. Thinking about your question, certainly it makes sense that you'd expect uh, a particle that never uh, effectively sees the superconductor, uh, would never end ray reflect. Um, that is, I agree with you there, but I don't know, uh, don't know the exact answer that you're aiming at. Thank you. So then uh, the next component is Professor Thomas Knight. So maybe we could uh, write a couple of those components of your PhD thesis. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to read and learn about your work. Um, I wanted to start with a question on chapter 4, and uh, I'll cover it for the experimentalists and also the experimentalists. Um, in the motivation of chapter 4, you write that there are several methods you want to. Characterized normal diffraction in, in narrow wires. 
Uh, and then you say, well, and this device is related to the superconductor, and, and so we need necessitating direct observations to know the interaction in Myra and Myra uh, But I really don't quite understand why some of these methods in the sentence just before couldn't be used also in this uh, device, I mean, the, the introduction of chapter 4.1, page 74. Yes, so I, yeah. Hoogeleerd oh, open end. Um, Thank you for the nice words about my thesis and for your question. So if I understand your question correct, you're asking why um, in the system that we, have, that we consider in this chapter, namely a system where we have a semiconducting nanowire uh, with induced superconductivity, so there is a superconductor on the outside, why can we not use the conventional methods uh, in order to estimate what the spin orbit coupling would be? So take, for example, I uh, know a bit about uh, weak anti-localization, which is an, an effect that happens in uh, disordered systems at, at, uh, in metals or semiconductors at very low temperature, where, um, where effectively you could have, depending on the presence of spin orbits, uh, or being there or not being there, uh, you see a cor correction to the, to the conductance. However, this is only true uh, for, uh, for conducting systems that don't have the superconductor. So, sorry, could, could you repeat what you said, Long? Uh, could you question superconductivity? Um, yeah, that, that, would, that would be possible, but that would induce uh, several other, uh, that have many other consequences within the system and it's very hard to to model such a system where you have a superconductor with a magnetic field so uh yes I think both of these statements uh, are correct, yes. That's the, yeah. Yeah, but we do compare, like, uh, uh, Zeeman will have a different type of gap closing uh, than, than the other effects. So what we do here mainly is we look at the, 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 the shapes of the gap closing. Uh, namely, here we compare all the different types of effects. And then what we say is, like, Zeeman would always... So, so without spin orbit coupling, you would always have shapes like this, where where the, this this is a linear, uh, or the gap close is linear with magnetic fields. Uh, no, no, to be honest, we have not tried that. I know that uh, some of my uh, co-workers uh, have a paper or a study on this where they do check this. Huh? And was this simply a matter of power? Is there, is there a good argument why, why they didn't think that was relevant? Or is that something that you can do for yourself? At the time, this other, the, uh, this is a weak statement, but in the, at the time this other study had not been done and we did not think about it. But um, thinking about it now, I don't think that the shapes of the, the gap close or yeah, the shape of the gap closing will change uh, when including this anisotropy in uh, the G factor. But is it really possible to, to tell? You know, are, are, are any uh, experiments so you know, maybe, maybe you could tell that they are linear really closing? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, um, Maybe later, I didn't have a question on chapter 6, or shall I 
Um, so yeah, this chapter is about uh, we compare junctions uh, that uh, have been predicted to have a lot of cool fe cool properties, namely the ones above. And what we do is we suggest this type of geometry um, to make to make it even cooler or to make it remotely possible. If there is a catch, um, maybe. Uh, for example, we. Um, there, there are, I have heard conflicting messages, like uh, there are uh, currently, uh, as far as I'm aware, five uh, groups that are trying to experimentally realize this system. However, uh, others have told me that the, the gap size, which is the exact problem that we're trying to solve, is not a problem. Uh, so, so there's that, but then there's also the question um, a, a junction that is just straight is much easier to fabricate than a junction that is zigzag. Uh, yeah, yeah, but apart from these parameters, is there, is there, sometimes there's a catch with the condition. I know, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying uh, definitively that there is no catch. Uh, just at the moment, I cannot think uh, of any. Are you satisfied with this answer? Okay, very well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Then let's move to the last opponent, which is Dr. Lima. Yeah, uh, 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 so I worked with you so long. Let's say so many words, but if you accept that, uh, I would like to highlight that you really have beautiful and unique colors for everybody of the, uh, the graduate group. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, mean, I, I would have a question regarding the proposition. Okay, um, which proposition? Position, proposition number 10. Okay. Yes. Wow. So, um, should I also read it in Dutch? Is this tradition yeah. or? Okay. So, uh, proposition number 10 says the amount of success in one's PhD depends more on one's ability to collaborate than on one's intelligence. Yes, so I have one question there, uh, because, you know, uh, in, the, you know in common, you know, our uh, in stereotypes of business are seen are actually now these highly intelligent, but very secluded people who are working alone and having breakthroughs on their own, um, which probably is actually based on certain examples. So I'm just wondering, this is a statement which is about uh, PhD and reading physics in general? Or with respect to a certain field, or maybe just to Delft, or what would you say with respect to that? So, um, zeer geachte, or hooggeachte promoter, thank you uh, for the compliments on the cover of my thesis. Um, and about the, uh, regarding the question you have on uh, proposition number 10. So, uh, I made I agree with this uh, proposition because I, I feel this uh, from personal experience. Um, and you say that some physicists, or at least big breakthroughs, have often happened by some very intelligent single individual. However, the vast majority of the work is not done by a single person uh, that, that is super intelligent, but on, it depends on collaboration. And the reason I think this is true is because, uh, maybe it's even more true in physics, is because they're often, uh, now I'm generalizing, but uh, if you would ask anyone, they, they say physicists are less social than maybe persons in social studies. So, uh, precisely because physicists are usually the very smart people and uh, they, they like to answer questions by themselves because they take pride in it, they want to do something complicated, so that's why they attempt to solve everything by themselves. Uh, I think there is a balance between how much you do yourself and how much do you ask other people to do simply because it can become very inefficient if you want to try to answer all the questions yourself. Uh, and for example, from, from my own personal experience, um, in like the many work that I, or a lot of work that I did, um, 
my strong suit is not particularly uh, doing analytical calculations, but I, I would say I'm rather good in doing numerics. So when I would get stuck at something, I would attempt it for a little bit, but then I would go to one of my coworkers that is an is a uh, expert on that very field, uh, and he would explain it or she would explain it to me, and vice versa. The next time that that person encounters something, um, he or she might feel more like, okay, boss knows about this, I'm going to ask him, and therefore creating this symbiotic relation in Thank research. Thank you, Madam Vito. The committee will deliver a Further behind closed doors, I request the candidate to follow the beetle and leave the room. The session is adjourned. Okay, I'll take all of this. Yeah, but you see the rain what the gebeurt. Oh, come on, you need it. This one. Yeah. Um, okay, okay. Oh yeah, dat is leuk. Oh ja, maar ik dacht nu kan ik een beetje, misschien hebben mensen wat vragen gesteld, mijn vrienden. Voor mij horen ze me nog steeds. Everyone can still hear me. Uh, let's see. Uh, I can turn on the camera. Oh. Hello. Uh, I'm going to try to join the chat. Marcella is uh, taking photos of the signing of my diploma. Mm. Live stream. Let's see. Ah, now I can see what everyone's writing. Oh, it's nice to see that there are 50 people watching. Yeah, so soon, like now they, everybody is this, or the professors are discussing whether I passed or not. Uh, it would have to be a unique, a unique moment in history for someone to not pass. So uh, let's hope uh, I'm not that exception. And then later they will sign my uh, diploma and uh, yeah, and then I'm a doctor. It was actually was actually much easier uh, than I thought, even though I did say several times that I didn't know how to answer a certain question, but I, I think that's allowed. So, what do you guys think of my uh, suit? There, there is a delay of... Uh, I don't know, like 20 seconds, I think, at least. <laughs> yeah? Oh, Marcel Lance back. What happened? I don't know the photos. Can you not, it does not work. Yeah, but I, it looks weird. It's a good installing. Yeah, it's yeah. good. It's okay. 
Yeah, maybe yeah. more from the top, but uh, okay. I don't know. Are you allowed to go there still? I don't know. I, why was that big? Why are we doing this? For you? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we set off that felt very awkward during the defense. Uh, because she, it was always, she said, like, I'm just sitting there in the corner, uh, not knowing what to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I, I did get a haircut uh, just this morning. So I, was, I think I was probably one of the first uh, in the Netherlands. Oh, Danielle's saying there is a delay between audio and uh, video. Sorry. <laughs> Jimmy's asking, like, uh, if everything's done now. No, I, I don't think so. There is, uh, or at least regarding to my uh, research. Um, I hope it's not, and I know for a fact that it's not, because also if, it, and if this would not be the case, then I would be without a job today. <laughs> yeah. What did you guys think about me sharing the, um, the PDF or my thesis on the screen? I think it was a pretty good idea. It was quite costly, to be honest, to set up this live uh, stream. I had to buy this thing for 200 euros, super fancy microphone, new laptop, which could accommodate the CPU stream or the intense CPU calculations to host the stream. Uh, people are helping each other with that. Uh, uh, one thing that I was very happy about, because I came like two hours earlier, um, to set everything up with Marcella, and uh, it was ex like in this thing, it's extremely warm. So then they like supercharged the airco, and, and now uh, at least Marcella was very cold, but uh, I was quite fine. Oh yeah, Willemijn said that I first didn't want to do the live stream, but uh, she convinced me to do so anyway. Yeah, Stein asks if the final part will be live as well. Like, yeah, I think so. Um, or it will be. However, I'm not sure if we have to wait until then, because uh, I might finish all my conversation topics with me and the laptop. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, Gerdy, like my voice, like, so actually the, uh, I recorded my sound directly on this thing and then the professors were on the speaker, so it was a speaker talking to this one, so that's why I think I was much clearer. Um, so she's asking if you want to put it up again before the... Oh yeah, can I do so now? Uh, yeah, she kind of asked me to do it. Oh, okay, Marcella has to set up the, the live stream again. <laughs> Um, okay, I have a good idea. You could just... She, you, have to, you have to walk in with her. Okay. So the okay. only thing you have to do, we could just do it on this one, maybe? Okay. Yeah. Beide? Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't want to go to the house. Maybe I'll wait. Is that also? Yeah. Yeah, you went around. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous. Wait, if I have this set up, then... Okay. Do we need to do it again? No, but she came first to the camera. Yeah. And then you go there via my camera. Where does this go? Oh, yeah. Are they ready to speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this one, and then I 
moet ik alleen heel even... Wat, wat wel jammer was, was dat alleen je proefschrift steeds in beeld Ja, maar dat konden ze dan... Uh, dat dat was een instelling moeten. van ja, uh, Skype. Ja. Ik zag het op mijn scherm, zag ik het wel, oh, kon ik het wel goed zien. Oh, dat ja. is fijn. Gaat die aan, die camera? Ja. Oh ja, ja, now it's good. Oké, okay, so you could just... Oeh, shit. De camera is veel te groot. Oh god. Ja, ben je het kunnen Shit. Review scaling. Fit. Ah, ja, yeah, now is it good. Oké, okay. so ja, yeah, the only thing you need to do is you literally just uh, deze kan dan zo. Ja. En dan, als je dit gewoon meeneemt, en dan met dan deze, je, moet je even, moet je even dan wacht ik even. Dan kan ja. Wil je het maar gewoon op tafel leggen, de computer? Ja. Dan zien zij het ook. Het is even voor de even de techniek. Sorry. I forgot uh, which parts do I do? Do we do standing and which? Beginning. Beginning. And but the uh, loadout or is sitting? Uh, not for oh. you. Ah, oh, okay. To stand. All right. Okay. We will be sitting. Yes. session and request the promovendors to stand in front of the committee. Het college for promoties van de Technische Universiteit Delft, vertegenwoordigd door de hier aanwezige commissie, heeft naar kennis genomen te hebben van uw proefschrift met stellingen en naar uw verdediging daarvan te hebben gehoord, met in achtneming van het bepaalde in de wet op het hoger onderwijs en wetenschappelijk onderzoek, besloten u de graad te verlenen van dokter. Ik verzoek de promotor door het college voor promoties als zodanig aangewezen, zich wel van de hem opgedragen taak te kwijten. Het kracht van de bevoegdheid bij wet toegekend aan het college voor promoties, verklaar ik namens dat college, hier vertegenwoordigd door de rector Magnificus en de overige leden van de commissie, bij deze u, Bas Nijholt, de bevorderen tot dokter, en u alle rechten te verlenen welke aan de dokters titel zijn verbonden. Ten bewijs ik hiervan overhandig u, ik u het diploma dat u recht geeft de titel dokter te voeren. Ondertekend door de rector Magnificus en de promotoren en voorzien van het zegel van de Technische Universiteit Delft. It is the uh, promoter's privilege to be the first to congratulate the young doctor. Dr. Akmarov, the floor is yours. Dear Dr. Nijholt, dear Bas, almost seven years ago now, you, at that time a master's student, attended a course, computational physics, 
where I was a co-instructor. This was, as, I, as far as I understand, your first encounter uh, of computer simulations. And as far as I remember, love at first sight. Your experience at that course was what led you to do your master's project in my group. You excelled in your project, which resulted uh, in you preparing a preprint of uh, your work already before defending your master thesis. One thing led to another, and this, and this convinced you uh, as well that it was worth giving a PhD a shot, an idea that I enthusiastically encouraged. Your PhD was about pushing the limits of the numerical simulations. A lot of your work has now become a standard of how to simulate Mariana devices. Your talent and expertise were recognized by Microsoft Research, which uh, invests perhaps the most effort in the topic. Not only did they hire you immediately, but as far as I understand, you essentially overhauled how they do numerical simulations even before starting to work there. And this brings me to perhaps your strongest motivation uh, in research. You're driven by passion to help people. Your defense was revolving exclusively about your work, but this ignores a big part of your motivation and your, uh, and your impact, one that I would not like to overlook. During your PhD, you have essentially reorganized and redefined how your group does numerical simulations. Uh, you have uh, updated a complete online course on topology of condensed matter. Uh, you, finally, you have taken time to implement the adaptive package something that we did not quite have time to discuss during the defense. While it was certainly benefiting your work, this package, uh, you also made your results uh, public as soon as, you have, as soon as you had something to share. The decision was the right one. Uh, that work is now used by many different people, from astrophysicists to people working in cyclotron facilities. Also on a personal level, you were the go-to person to help every group member with simulations. A PhD is not only about answering questions, it's about making a difference. Despite working in an extremely specialized field, you improved, you helped a lot of people also outside of your specialization, and I think this is what makes your doctorate special. Turning to the future, I'm certain that your expertise on Mariana devices will only become more important. Uh, continuing to look broader than uh, your daily work is part to most of that, to most of us. But nevertheless, that I'm, I'm certain that you will continue uh, being an outstanding member of your community. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akmarov, for your kind words. Learned Dr. Nayold, you have now the right to use the title of doctor. Your doctorate means that society can rely on your judgment, that you will act transparently and communicate independently about your results and the social relevance of your work. In other words, your doctorate implies that you will uphold scientific integrity. I wish you a great deal of wisdom and prosperity with your new degree. On behalf of the Board for Doctorates of Delft University of Technology, I congratulate you and your family on earning your doctoral degree. Dr. Nairold, you may now return to your seat, but you don't have one, so <laughs> I guess you will leave the room. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Oh, yeah. I think I should keep this. I thank you for your presence, and I hereby close this academic session. So, we would now like to make some pictures. How does that work? And I don't know exactly how it works, but uh, I was asked that this should opportunity should be here, or maybe with the camera. We gotta get down the camera. Oh yeah, they, that one is there. Right? Oh, thanks for that, yeah. But maybe we can turn off the yeah. live stream. Oh. Okay.
Everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, we're going offline now. I'll speak to all of you soon. Bye. Uh, so.